Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. Uh, today, we are joined by Ben O'Brien Smith from Sounds Like a Drum. Ben, how are you, man? Doing excellent. Thanks so much for having me here. Sure, sure. I'm excited to uh, to talk to you about the history of drum heads. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into this and your background um, with drum heads? Absolutely. So I started working with Diderio and Company, owners of Evans Drum Heads, back in 2010, and worked for them for a period of just over six and a half years. Uh, was a product specialist there and did uh, everything from brand management to product development to managing their social channels, and then actually went on to focus in, entirely on their digital marketing and social media strategy and community management towards the last year and a half or so that I was there. Uh, but I was responsible for developing products like the Evans UV1, uh, the, let's see, the Heavyweight, the Reza 7, uh, a variety of different, very uh, specific niche style drum heads that we added to the line over the course of time that I was there. Cool. Cool. Well, it sounds like you're the, uh, the right guy to talk to for this, uh, for this episode. I yeah. am so interested in this because I keep hearing the other experts I talk to talking about stretching out calfskin heads and drying them on the roofs of the factories and when it actually switched to the mylar and um yeah so i'll let you take it away man i um, let's let's just go back as far as you can and uh and learn about drum heads as far as we know for as long as there have been drums there have pretty much been some form of membrane being stretched over uh some sort of object whether it was a cylindrical object or um, any kind of like small cavernous, if you will, sort of, uh, sort of device in order to create a resonating body. And I mean, drums and percussion are, they are the original instrument. They are the first instrument, maybe, maybe second to voice, yeah. um, but the first instrument outside of the voice. And so for, for thousands of years, for the, I mean, potentially quite longer, uh, you had drums that were being played and being made with all different forms of oftentimes animal skin, animal hide being used as the membrane. Um, and that could vary depending on what animals were around. You know, we often tend to think of uh, calf skin and goat skin as the kind of the be all end all when it comes to animal hide. Um, but there were all sorts of different types of animal hides being used you know, looking way back hundreds and hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, um, because of what was around and because of the development, the, the evolution of these animals, that tonal instruments, um, that you know, performance tonal instruments were brought in, in addition to voice. And even then, those were also using uh, the guts of, of those individual animals to be able to create tension strings and all sorts of different types of, uh, of plucked, uh, and strummed instruments, things like that. These hides were being stretched, cured, and tucked into some form of a what is often referred to as a flesh hoop. Hmm. Um, and that's now in, in modern drums, it's what we refer to as just the hoop, or it, sometimes we'll talk about it as the rim of the drum head, but that yeah. often gets confusing with the rim of the drum itself. Yeah. Um, and there were all sorts of different methods for this. Um, you had um, a very traditional tucking process, which is not all too dissimilar from how um, calf skin and other sorts of animal hide uh, drum heads are tucked today, um, where you would get the material wet. It would be incredibly pliable and malleable, and you would basically tuck it around a wooden ring. And so now we're going, we're really fast forwarding into uh, the, the, let's see, looking at like the 19th century or so 18th 19th century um and you've got drums that are being of course made out of wood you've got wooden hoops that are being made out of basically off-cut sections of these drums and then you have this membrane being tucked around it and then there's you know traditionally of course rope tuned drums um seen in in different armies you've got these these armed forces marching around with drums that are affected by everything from the temperature and the, the humidity to, of course, the rain. Yeah. And you've got armed forces marching through all sorts of different conditions. I mean, looking back at it, it's kind of amazing that so much of that marching process was based around the, the drums. It was based around that cadence. And 
yet they would march through any weather and yeah. had to deal with kind of whatever the circumstances were. Uh, and there wasn't any alternative whatsoever. And so there wasn't a whole lot of change in that over the course of time, um, maybe just in simple little tucking techniques and things like that. Um, but for the most part, it was seen as, well, this is what we're stuck with right now. I, I would wonder, this seems like a pretty specialized skill to be the drumhead maker. Um, so I imagine that was like a role that someone would have. It's not the same where right now everyone can go out and buy their Evans or their Remo head and then put it on their drum. So I imagine that was probably something that was maybe handed down generation to generation, this technique of stretching and getting the calf skin or whatever goat skin and uh and doing that right so I'm, I'm i'm i imagine that would be something like ceremonial that's a pretty special thing for for people to know how to do yeah you know depending on the culture i think it definitely saw a lot more focus and, and was given that degree of importance um it's tough to say whether there was ever a dedicated uh, drumhead maker within a given community. Sure. Um, thinking about the way that there would be, you know, later on, uh, metal smiths and yeah. all sorts of, of families that would focus on one aspect of life. Um, I think that oftentimes you would have those that were responsible for making the drums were also responsible for making the heads themselves. Yeah, that makes and sense. Th that was all part of the process. Uh, cool. Rather than being able to, you know, kick it off to your buddy who who does all the uh, the calf skin tucking and things of that nature. Yeah. Well, so then fast forwarding to the the also what you were saying, I'm assuming once you're getting into more of like there's multiple there's there's factories creating drums, um, albeit maybe it's early on where they're they're small factories, whoever. But it seems like it probably got more uniform where it the drum was the same size. You're not cutting it out of a. Uh, a tree and then using intestines from a goat to, to, to keep the head on. So I think as we're going on, from what I can tell is things are getting more uniform. They're getting more, the drums are the same sizes. They're, they're the snare for the army. You're going to have to make a thousand of them, 10,000 of them. They got to be uniform. Yeah. And I mean, at the same time, it was still, you know, if we're talking about like the, the mid to late 1800s or so, where you've got the development and some of the standardization of drum design there, um, you're, you're still using these natural hide skin drum heads. Yeah. And the, one of the beauties of that is that it's still incredibly forgiving. And if you've got a drum that's slightly oversized or a little out of round, which just naturally these had to be, yeah. there, there wasn't a chance that they were in perfect round. And it wasn't really necessary, again, because you didn't have something that was, you didn't have a head that was being designed and manufactured in such a way that it had to be so consistent. Um, in a way, that's kind of the challenge that we see with, uh, with modern drum heads is that because of the, the escalation of, um, of repeatability in manufacturing, there's this challenge of fitting modern drum heads to vintage drums. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about that later on. Sure. Um, getting into the late 1800s, now into early 1900s, you've got some of these drum companies, I mean, they're starting to pop up all over the place. You've got um, Gretsch Drums is making some of their own drum heads. Yep. Uh, Rogers is making some of their own drum heads. There's a variety of these different brands, often who are already responsible for making something within the world of drums, and they're tucking heads to be used on these drums. And at that point, we're still talking mostly about um, marching oriented, you know, band style drums. Um, but then of course, getting into the twenties, you've got the, the birth of the drum set Yeah, and you've got, and actually it might be the late teens. And I, I should probably check my dates on that one. Um, but as far as I know, the development of the drum set, um, in New Orleans and the, the pairing of all of these instruments into something that is a, a trap set sort of contraption that um, one person can play. Exactly. So you don't need to have one person on bass drum, one person on snare drum, and all these other disparate elements. The double drumming kind of technique. It's funny, you see the old pictures, like the guy who has a snare on a chair, and then he's got a giant yeah. marching bass drum where he's taking... He's, it's just funny how evolution happens where it says, hey... I could do both of these at the same time, 
but it is also mm-hmm. corresponding with that trap setup where they they say, "Let me add on a police rattle. Let me add on um, these blocks." So um, yeah, that's cool. So people are it, it's it is as you said, standardizing the drum set a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Well, and at that same time you've got these drums becoming a stationary instrument as opposed to a marching oriented instrument yeah so you now you've got a little bit more control you're starting to see that there are drums that are being built with lamps inside them yes. in order to help stabilize the tuning of the drum head because you would have this change in temperature or if you're in certain climates uh you were you know you're kind of at the the mercy of mother nature and where things are at with regards to humidity and temperature and all that is affecting the sound of your drums and of course little things like incorporating lamps into the the drums seems like a strange thing now but it made all the difference to be able to help get some degree of control over them without having to to tune them every time something went out well, and um, yeah, and, and Mark Cooper on the previous episode just talked about that, where it also adds that little bit of, uh, I was like, I'm kind of confused, because at first I thought it was a cool thing, where it's a, like a gimmick factor, and then it, it is mm-hmm. obviously for the, um, he kind of brought to my attention that it's, it is both. Um, but, and just to clarify, mm-hmm. which is, I think it's pretty obvious to everyone, but the temperature is affecting, it's like your skin, where if it's, if it's colder, it affects it one way by tightening the head, and if it's warmer it will then loosen because it is actual flesh from an animal where it 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 is affected mm-hmm. by the temperature so that is absolutely the biggest mm-hmm. issue for these guys at that point in time yeah and you you can even see similar effects with modern synthetic drum heads um, if you put them through extremes um, and and it's tough to tell sometimes it's the drum head itself but oftentimes if it's a particularly if it's a wooden drum um, the drum will can contract and uh and expand a little bit depending on those uh those factors of weather yeah um so you, you'll notice that if you leave your drums if you tend to leave them next to a heater or something like sure. that and you move them away the uh, the change in in the sound and tuning overall all right so now we're kind of in that 20s area uh the drum set is happening there's trap drummers um this is obviously a an industry so drumming, like you mentioned, has gone from being kind of a, uh, um, a a less uniform kind of thing, and now it's turning into a little bit of an industry. We've got Gretsch, we've got Rogers, we've got people doing it themselves. Um, so, yeah, why don't you take it from there? Yeah, so this is definitely an interesting one. So you've got all of all of a sudden now music is really turning into a form of, of entertainment at a different level, at least here in the United States. And as the drum industry is starting to grow, um, there's more and more drummers and more and more people running into these same challenges of dealing with um, the temperamental nature of oftentimes at this point, uh, at least for traditional style drum set drum heads, the vast majority of them are made of some form of calf skin. Um, there's still some goat skin, but for the vast majority, it really is calf. And so people started to experiment and fast forward a couple of decades to the 40s um, and World War II and uh, a company by the, the name of DuPont develops this this material, this plastic material, um, this polyester film um, that they give the brand name of Mylar. And that all of a sudden kickstarts things a little bit with regards to the development of synthetic drum heads. Wow. And while while there really wasn't a, a usable, successful, like something that could be brought to market and repeatedly produced, uh, synthetic drum head until the mid fifties, there were definitely lots of experiments taking place. And there were some, there were some small manufacturers that claimed to have developed some form of a weatherproof drum head. And that's really how they were being referred to is people were looking for these weatherproof drum heads, something that could, uh, could deal with moisture and whether it was in the form of rain or in a more subtle form with humidity, um, and be able to, uh, to withstand those changes over the course of time. So lots of experimentation taking place with, with all sorts of different materials, even outside of, uh, of mylar. Um, but in the end, it was mylar that did the trick. And so this is when we start to have much better documentation of 
specific years and periods of time when these developments were taking place. And amazingly enough, I haven't seen a lot of this published anywhere. Um, so it's kind of interesting that this a lot of this history is still pretty closely held. Um, but it was Chick Evans, uh, jazz drummer in New Mexico, um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, who was starting to have some success in developing some form of a synthetic drum head that could be repeatedly manufactured. And over the course of several years, starting in the what looks like probably early 50s or so, um, he was able to get it to the point where he could actually put these heads on and they would hold their tune and they would they wouldn't die out fast. They wouldn't break. Um, they were actually not very susceptible to at least softer playing. He was a softer drummer, or at least that's how he described himself um, as a jazz player. And he decided that he was going to go about manufacturing these and, and getting them out to the world. And so this was in, in 1956. Uh, he filed for a patent for the first synthetic drum head. And this is what really kicks off a lot of the drama. And so interestingly enough, and not a lot of people know this, but in, in March, it was a uh, very early March of 1957. Chick sent a, a message, a, uh, a letter to drum city in Hollywood. Hmm. And this was a drum shop. This was like the famous drum shop in, in Los Angeles um, where drummers were buying all of their gear from. And it happened to be a shop uh, that Remo Belli was working at. Wow. And I, actually, I believe was a uh, co-owner of. Wow. And so he sent this message to them with the announcement of the Evans Weatherproof Drumhead Company and basically pitching, hey, we've done this thing. We think it's amazing. It works really well. Um, please don't compare this to any of the other inferior products you've heard about um, that simply don't hold up. We really, truly believe that we have something that's going to change the world of drumming. And they offer to, to sell them, you know, a, a snare side and a snare batter. And pretty soon after, um, literally within a, a couple of days, uh, Remo replies, and, and decides he's going to go ahead and buy two of these drum heads. Actually, I think he bought several more of those. Um, I've seen copies of these purchase orders. That's, that's the only reason I can make specific reference hmm. to yeah. those. Yeah. Um, but there are lasting purchase orders of the individual drum heads purchased and the total cost of those. Um, so I think Remo ended up purchasing a full set of them, um, just a, one each of a, uh, like a batter snare head, uh, snare side head, uh, I believe like a 13 and a 16 inch Tom and then a, a 20 inch bass drum head. Hmm. And so they tried these out, put them through the testing and then responded back to Rima or responded back to chick saying, you're right. You've done it. Wow. We think that you've, you've actually come across something that is interesting here and this is working. And so these, to give a little bit of context, these drum heads, still looked incredibly similar to what we're used to with regards to caskin heads. Hmm. It was a piece of polyester film, uh, this mylar that was tacked on, like physically tacked onto a wooden hoop. Uh, and I believe these were actually uh, hoops made by Ludwig. Um, oh, wow. Forcing them from Ludwig drums um, and hand tacking them all, all, all basically with like thumbtacks hmm. holding these little sections on. Jeez. And, um, I've, I've held one of these drum heads and it's amazing. I mean, there's no collar on it whatsoever. Nothing is being done to mold it. You're basically taking this material and packing it onto the, uh, the flesh hoop. And then that's enough for the, the drum hoop to contact and then apply pressure to, and then it would mold and conform to the bearing edge of the drum. Wow. And Man. so th this is, this is where things really get wild. And so Remo, makes it clear that they're quite interested in these drum heads and is basically makes the pitch to, to Chick Evans that he's interested in taking on the Evans drum head, the Evans weatherproof drum head company as a distributor. He wants to distribute Evans drum heads. And I want to make this abundantly clear. This is Remo himself saying he'd like to distribute Evans drum heads via drum city in Hollywood, California. <laughs> Oh man. I mean, that's 
crazy to think of these giants yeah. now. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. And it, wow. it kind of, it, it contradicts, unfortunately, it contradicts a lot of what has been written down in quite a few places with regards to um, Remo drumheads being the first ever synthetic drumheads. Uh, when in all reality, Remo um, it could have been experimenting for sure, but expressed an interest in wanting to, you know, purchase these drum heads from Evans, was interested in distributing them through his shop. And, you know, at this point, Chick Evans has applied for a patent oh. on these yeah. and is moving forward with the development of the business. You know, and this is, this is a jazz drummer. This guy is not a businessman. Oh. Um, he, probably doesn't have the business chops that Remo does himself. Yeah. Um, he's not working at a drum shop. He doesn't, he's not thinking quite that same way. Industry he's and yeah. That he's working with. Wow. Exactly. And I mean, at the same time now, Remo's a player himself as well, but has this a little bit more business background with his time at drum city. Man. And so all of a sudden things really kick into high gear and it, it's kind of, um, it's strange coincidence that we should be having this conversation today because uh, it was literally 62 years ago this week that all of this conversation was going down as there's telegraphs back and forth and there's letters going back and forth between Remo himself and Chick Evans uh, with their interest in meeting up and discussing this. Um, and, you know, Remo wants to visit in person and they're discussing the kind of the the capabilities of this industry and what does this look like from a repeat sales standpoint and what about the aesthetic and the capability you know at this point all these heads are they're clear drum heads so what are we going to do about brush playing well chick evans mentions that you can spray on a a lacquer of sorts onto these heads from a texture standpoint and you might have to reapply over a course of time yeah. but that that does a sufficient job with brushes and remo had also asked about the the aesthetic of bass drum heads with a concern about the ability to see straight through and that's again where uh, Chick assured him that you could easily reapply or apply some form of a white lacquer spray um, or any color in lacquer onto the material itself. Hmm. Which is obviously a coated head, which we're very, very familiar with it, today. Exactly. And I mean, and this is a conversation that's taking place like mid March 1957. You know, before these things are even out really on the market. I mean, he's been selling these one off to individual players. There's the potential that maybe he'd sold them to a couple of shops, but he didn't have any form of distribution or anything like that. No. Um, and he was just kind of like casting about, hoping that he would be able to find the right people to, to take on his heads. And uh, it, he kind of struck gold in the, the fact that Reno himself was very interested in carrying these drum heads and then distributing it to a wide variety of shops throughout California. So he wanted exclusivity on the state of California for distribution. Wow. And it, it should be noted that 1957 is obviously, it's, it's mentioned as the year that Remo basically, uh, quote unquote, developed the polymer head, um, which would be using the technology that was originally created by DuPont, right, in the World War II, kind of mm -hmm. uh, the 40s, that era. Um, so then Chick Evans, he's using that technology and creating this. Then in 57, it seems like it's locked in that Remo is now going to use this and distribute it under the name Remo. So this is when we are actually... There's no mention of Evans as a company, correct? It's these are being distributed by Remo. Well, it, it's still Evans Weatherproof Drumhead Company. Oh, That's wow. established in 1956. So, and this is unfortunately where again uh, some of the companies have tucked this under the rug, um, and some of some of this information is presented clearly on the the Evans website. Um, if you look at the history under the Remo website, uh, it establishes that on June 2nd, the Remo crown logo uh, is established um, mm. and Remo Incorporated is created to market supposedly the first sin successful synthetic drum head. Now, of course, one could say that that argument is based on your definition of successful. I was going to say, that's your key word right there is successful. Exactly. And so then we're talking about, well, was it because of the distribution channels that they're defining it as successful and their ability to really bring it to mass market? 
or you know because oftentimes the presentation will be well it was the first you know usable synthetic drum head like it was successful and that you could actually play on this thing but from a performance standpoint it was really the, the Evans Weatherproof Drumhead Company that their first head, as also signed off on by Remo Belli himself, um, they determined that was the first viable candidate for something like this. Um, wow. And, you know, they purchased even more drumheads. They started purchasing more drumheads from Chick with the intention of selling these and um, visited him in person. Um, you know, I've seen copies of, of telegrams going back and forth between them, um, mostly showing this urgency from Remo himself that he's, he's very interested in getting this conversation going and keeping things moving as quickly as possible. And we're getting towards like the end of March in 1957. And he pays a visit to, uh, to Chick himself. And uh, as far as I know, this is, again, this is right about 62 years ago to the week um, that he stops by, you know, he books a flight out to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and visits Chick in person. And it's tough to tell. There's some rumor about this, and some of it's accounted in these letters back and forth. But from what we can tell, apparently Remo visited and kind of made this decision that he was going to go out and see Chick in person and wasn't quite able to get in touch with him to get all the details together, but he provided information about when his flight was going to get in and all that and didn't hear a whole lot back from Chick. And he showed up, and I guess Chick was apparently hung over from the night before. <laughs> and there's, you know, there's all sorts of rumors around this, but apparently – Chick was not up to speed. He was under the weather to whatever degree. Yeah. You know, you can look into that as far as you see fit. Um, but to that that point, um, they met. They had a discussion uh, at Chick's home, and apparently, they it was a very successful meeting between the two. Um, Chick, or rather, uh, Remo had inquired about the inventory list of all the stock that they had ready to go, basically showing that, you know, yes, I'm interested. I want to see how quickly we can get this thing going. You know, he wants to know about getting those heads out there and shipping them to California as soon as possible. And Chick expresses an interest in, uh, in potentially visiting California for the percussion fair that's going to be taking place in April at that point. And they start to make some plans about this. And, you know, they're bouncing around the idea back and forth of, of, you know, should we, should I purchase the entire stock or should we go kind of um, piecemeal and start to float this idea out there. And Remo basically guarantees Chick that I'm not going to be selling this directly to customers. I'm going to be selling this, or to consumers rather. I'm going to be distributing this to these different shops and want to make sure that we're getting a fair distribution price and that we're really setting up a good business practice here from the start. So everything, all the conversations you would normally have if you were launching a product even today. Then, of course, and I know I've said it a couple of times, but this is where things get really, really interesting. And you've got some questions coming about from Remo himself towards the very end of March about, well, can you tell me some more about this patent that you've got application out there for? Um, you know, he wants, he wants to know what the, the patent number is so he can do a little bit of research on this. And... Then there's uh, another communication um, that the details of the patent um, would be unrestricted in terms of competition from other manufacturers so that this patent isn't doing a whole lot to really like lock down what they've come up with yeah. or what uh, Chick has come up with. And so they're going back and forth a little bit. And now there's question about the fact that you know, since this head has already been sold on the market and there's this question about the degree of protection with this patent, um, now there's, it's a little up in the air. It's like, well, wait a second, which, which direction is this going to go? And then, you know, as we see on, on the Remo website, they announced that it was June 2nd, 1957, um, that Remo Incorporated was, was born and that the, there was the adoption of this Remo crown logo. Um, and, it's only a couple weeks after that that an, a letter from Chick Evans is sent to Remo himself, um, basically calling out Remo and asking, well, wait a second. I, I've, I've been informed now that you're, you're producing your own polyester drum heads. Wow. And 
you know, you're ignoring the fact that I have this, this pending patent and, you know, I, I want to see what you're doing. And basically said, like, I, I'm going to buy, I would like to buy two of your drum heads, you know, two 14s, a top and a bottom for a snare. And this is where it's just the, the drama is really escalating. And there's now Remo Incorporated is, it, this is separate from Drum City. This is a whole different enterprise. And Remo himself has a secretary that's handling some of these communications now. And there's an offer that comes about with regards to, um, to essentially paying off Chick Evans um, to, and it's unfortunately a lot of the information is it kind of falls off at this point, but was offering to pay him to essentially provide the patent, the pending patent to Remo Incorporated and kind of walk away and saying that, you know, we don't really have to do this, but we're going to be filing and we would like to take over your patent and we're willing to pay you a sum of money for that patent. Hmm. And we'd also like to buy all of your existing stock. Wow. And so, yeah. And so this is, we're, we're looking at, at this point, uh, late July, early August, 1957. And that's where at least the communications kind of run dry but we can assume that something along those lines ended up happening um, because the patent that had been applied for, and this is information that's available um, simply through uh, a, a patent search, um, the patent that had been applied for um, was on the 15th of, let's see, it's the 15th of August in 1957. And so it looks like the, either either Chick was successfully bought off by Remo or Remo was able to somehow side skirt around this patent that was pending with the development of something that was a little bit more robust um, and that he could, uh, he could move forward with because he also had made the claims that you didn't really have a whole lot of protection over this. Other people could be manufacturing something quite similar. Hmm. And wow. so he developed his own patent um, and was granted that patent um, a little less than three years later in 1960. And then things just take off. And uh, I should also mention as part of, uh, part of the request um, by uh, transferring over this patent was also that he would not um, engage in the manufacture of drum heads uh, for at least a period of time. I'm, I can't quite remember. I would assume it was something like five years or something like that. Five so or 10 years. Remo has told Remo has told Evans to not compete, exactly. do not make any drum heads. I'm going to be taking all of this, the patents and everything. Um, mm -hmm. Oh my God, man. That's, uh, that's wild. Yeah. Right. This is, this is the information that I haven't found very many places, but the, the reason I can back it up is because I've seen these physical letters and I've seen these telegrams. And uh, I, I hope that that's stuff that's all made publicly available at some point in the future. Yeah. Uh, but really. it really is some, interesting some wild history from that point on um, yeah i mean well just to pause for a sec it kind of makes it makes you feel a little weird because i personally am a remo guy and i've always loved remo drum heads and i equate it to this classic company where i honestly thought they were one of the creators of the you know the modern synthetic drum head and I don't know why this is again just something I didn't know. I thought Evans would have just come out of the the woodwork in the like seventies or eighties and just been a company that was like, mm -hmm. um, you know, here's a. Uh, it's similar to I'm a Zildjian guy. I thought Sabian just kind of mm -hmm. popped up out of nowhere because they they wanted to compete with Zildjian. <laughs> then you find out about yeah. Robert Zildjian starting Sabian because of the dispute with the whole. You know, the, they both had the family secret. Man. I, I I I don't know how to feel right now. I feel weird. <laughs> it's it's like it's like odd. Um, that's just a lot of interesting history that is 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 not widely known. Now, do you think this is something that uh, Remo doesn't want people to know? I mean, are they like let's keep this under the rug because we're obviously it looks it makes us look like the bad guy because we're. I mean, they didn't technically steal. Well, I guess they kind of did steal the the intellectual property, and just kind of circumvented the uh, patent process, right? I mean, can you help mm -hmm. clarify that the legality? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what it, 
what it ends up sounding like is exactly that, that unfortunately, due to the presentation of this information and the product itself um, to, from Chick Evans to Remo Belli and the team at Drum City, um, that they took that and expressed an interest early on in distributing these and dug in and started to do some of the due diligence and uh, discovered that the patent that was pending did not have, it wasn't exactly bulletproof. It didn't have the degree of protection that, uh, that they thought that something like this should have. And I can only imagine, and of course, this is just pure speculation on my part, but connecting the dots, it seems like in some room, there was some conversation of, uh, well, we can do this. Yeah. And we probably have better resources to do it than this drummer in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Wow. And so, and they, and truth be told, they did. And all it takes is a quick look at the, the developments that took place, even within only 12 to 18 months after that patent, or after, yeah, after filing that patent, after Reno himself filed the patent, um, that they were developing an aluminum channel um, flesh hoop with a poured resin that was holding the film in rather than having to manually tack on yeah. this material on the outside. So they really were taking this this ball and going like all the way into the end zone. And it was very impressive work in the development. I mean, again, none of this should, should in any way diminish the value of all of the different things that Remo did in developing drum heads and really furthering that technology. But it's very interesting to see how it all came about. Yeah. It's the reverse engineering. Um, again, I think everyone might feel the same way of like, well, yeah, they made it a lot better, but then they kind of plowed over the little guy, which would be Chick Evans at this point. Um, and I'm now, I guess, just kind of moving it forward here. Evans at that point was a company. So they were then making drum heads simultaneously, correct? They didn't just say, oh, well, we lost the patent. Okay, we're done. Because obviously Evans today is a massive, huge company. So how did that go? Well, and that's that's where some of the information starts to fall off, and it's tough to say how exactly all of it came about. Um, but at a certain point in time, um, Chick Evans sold the Evans Drumhead Company brand um, to a man by the name of Bob Beals, and that was in Dodge City, Kansas. That's where Evans was moved to, and uh, from as much as I can tell, that's where the development of the next generation of Evans drum heads took place. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Bob passed away in 2010. And some of, some of the information that he has is, is documented, um, but there's not a ton out there, not, certainly not to the degree of the, uh, the letters that I'd shared and the, the information um, from those communications between Chick Evans and Rima himself. Wow. Um, okay. I, you know, I do believe, let's see, I think it was in, it was like either the late, late fifties or the early sixties that Bob became involved with Chick Evans and, and working on the drum heads and taking, I don't know if he officially took over at a certain point early on there, or if they were working a little bit more side by side. Um, but Bob at that time, um, uh, had a shop as far as I know, um, and he was doing, I'm trying to remember what the deal was there, um, but he was trying to demonstrate, Chick was trying to demonstrate the value of this drum head and he was, he was kind of pitching it to him and went so far as to, to actually pouring water on the drum head as part of his pitch. Wow. And that really impressed Bob. He was blown away by these capabilities and, and they they started some degree of an alliance, and I, I want to say that it was the end of the 50s, most likely 1959, um, soon after this drama had taken place uh, with Remo, um, that he purchased the Evans Drumhead Company from Chick Evans. Gotcha. And started to refine the design a little bit and develop things and started to to come up with the first different designs of drum heads that there would be under the Evans name to make it more again it sounds like chick was more of a, a a dreamer and the a drummer versus like a 
businessman, which ultimately to oh, to his kind of somewhat downfall, Remo was a businessman. Uh, sounds like businessman first, drummer second. Um, Wow, man, that is uh, that's some wild stuff that I had no idea anything about. So I'm like blown away right now. Um, and there's they're obviously not the first; they're not the only drumheads in existence. But I think obviously at that point that was what was happening. So um, why don't we fast forward a little bit? And uh, I mean, so that's that seems like that's when things changed. That was the 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 advent of modern drumheads, where minus mm-hmm. some you know. I'm sure some technical things, they, it seems to be what we're using today, like the weather King and and all this, you know, these particular lines. Um, so did anything change after that? Well, there were little changes over the course of time, um, with regards to the consistency of production, uh, especially when it came to the hoops themselves. Um, but if we're looking at, um, immediate developments soon after Remo's awarded that patent, um, they start to release some different variations on drum heads. The, uh, the Ambassador, as we know it, uh, came out in 1959. So that came pretty soon afterwards. Um, the original Ambassador, um, especially for, for Remo fans that are familiar with the original Ambassador um, that's now referred to as the Vintage Ambassador, they brought it back. Uh, that was a two-ply drum head. Um, and a year later, they decided that they could produce this as a single ply of 10 mil. And a lot of this came from the availability of that film. You know, they, in most cases, they weren't having film custom made for them. They were acquiring this stuff and it was already being made for other industries. You know, in the case of Mylar and development early on, it was for the aeronautics industry in World War II. I was just going to say, so, man, I think I thought I remember reading, didn't they use it as... In, in like the film for like reconnaissance cameras or something like that? All sorts of different elements. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Now you look around today and polyester film is absolutely everywhere. Hmm. It, not just in packaging, but also it's, it's the material that's incorporated in the screens. It's, um, it's a film that's used to shade windows, like all sorts of things. In, in some cases, it is literally the same film that drum heads are being made out of. Wow. Uh, a great example of this is um, the film that's used for x-rays. That's oftentimes a seven and a half mil black film. Wow. That is very similar to a lot of the other seven and a half mil black films that we see on the market being used in, in making drum heads. But yeah, so when it came to developments that were taking place shortly after that, uh, Remo was starting to launch different variations on these drum heads. Of course, um, most of us have probably seen that famous drum photo of uh, Remo st- sitting in front of a giant bass drum. Yep. Um, if you're if you're not familiar with this one, it was uh, basically a 10 foot tall, uh, I believe like 40, 42 inch deep bass drum uh, that was made for uh, for Disneyland. And oh, that's cool! I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, it's, and it was used in parades and all sorts of things uh, starting in 1961. And I believe it still holds the Guinness Book of World Re- World Records record for the largest bass drum. Wow, that's something. Yeah. And so, of course, over the course of this time, they're experimenting with all sorts of different types of materials. But what do we know takes place just about three years after that that moment in 1961? Of course, the Beatles perform on the Ed Sullivan Show. Yes. And this really propels a small handful of brands into the public eye. And so now you've got, you know, Ludwig is way out there. Um, you know, Gretsch guitars are all of a sudden quite visible um, to the point where, you know, Gretsch had had to move their manufacturing around and start segregating their business with the manufacturing of drums separate from guitars because they simply didn't have the space in Brooklyn to do it all. Mm. And so with Remo, they're, you know, moving to new locations, they're developing new manufacturing facilities, and things are going gangbusters. You know, they're starting to develop um different materials like the sparkle tone drum heads. If you ever saw those with the, um, the kind of like mirrored finish, yeah, yeah. Uh, similar to what we were seeing and all, all sorts of different, um, different patterns. You'd see, uh, um, like these, these green and red sparkles. And I think they have blue sparkle as well. And then at the same time, uh, Evans was starting to do swirls, 
that they they were getting their feet underneath them and manufacturing these heads again. And you'll see some some photos. In fact, I've seen some of these heads in person of these different swirl materials um, that again have a very similar polyester film design to them. Um, but they've got this kind of appearance, um, almost like a holographic kind of thing, um, where if you change the angle, all of a sudden the swirl changes dramatically and you get a really interesting retro kind of vibe out of those. Yeah, which which is um, almost kind yeah. of coming full circle to today where you get like the color tone and uh, it's, yep. it, which to a lot of people, it's probably like, oh, that's a new technology, but no, that's been going on for <laughs> 50 years now. Yeah, it's amazing. At that point, I mean, you've got things like fiber skin being developed in 1975. Um, and even prior to that, uh, in the, I believe it's uh, 1970, 1971, there was the development of the Evans hydraulic heads. And of course, that, that was one of those happy accidents of some oil getting between two pieces of material for a two-ply head and then discovering that it actually changes the sound in such a dramatic way. And so... Remo answered the, the hydraulic with the development of the pinstripe head yeah. using a very similar concept, but masking it off only to the outside, recognizing that that way they would be able to fine tune some of the overtone control. And that's really when you start to have the development of this, uh, this concept of not just um, aesthetic variation in drum heads, but in the construction for the pure state of altering sound and controlling the acoustic sound of the drum head itself. Yeah, because in the 70s, you kind of have that, uh, I always equate it to like Steve Miller band, but that like very dampened t-shirts on the tom kind of like dead, oh, yeah. dead yep. sound concert tom kind of thing. Um, so why not mm -hmm. play on it and, and, and actually create it, um, which is amazing. So that... I mean, in, in as far as I can tell, that seems to be like, I, I didn't know the hydraulic heads. I didn't know that existed in the 70s. I mean, that's something, all of these things, I guess you equate it to when you first discover it. And I think to myself, oh, that must have been in like the 90s. But that's the right. key takeaway from all of this for me is like, wow, this technology has just been so, it's just been happening for so long. And you, you kind of take that for granted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's incredible how long this stuff has really been around for. Um, and it's interesting how some of this information is very readily available and some of it not so much. Um, you know, Remo actually has a, a fantastic timeline on their website that showcases a lot of these developments on their end, um, which is pretty an impre pretty impressive thing to go through. Definitely worth it if you're ever looking to, uh, to go through and see all the different varieties of heads and really when they came out. It's quite well documented on their site. Hmm. Um, I, I kind of wish that Evans had something similar at this point. Yeah, that would uh, help clarify a little bit of the um, the confusion on who did what and who discovered what and patents and all that stuff. And uh, and yeah, and now we're lucky because today we live in a time where we can get any kind of drum head we want, which there's obviously more companies than uh, Evans and Remo, um, Aquarian obviously being one. I'm a big fan of the Super Kick 2 bass drum head, um, mm -hmm. which I love. Oh, yeah. Um, and obviously they're, they're regular heads and there's, there's more brands beyond that, but, um, yeah. And I think this is a perfect opportunity unless there's more things that you'd like to fill in here. But I think once you get the drum heads, actually knowing how to tune them and how to treat them correctly and put them, even putting them on, we all know about the star formation, but if you get your first, uh, mm -hmm. if you get your first drum head, you can, we've all been there where we screw up a $50 bass drum head cause we tune it in the wrong way the first time. But um, Ben, why don't you uh, tell people a little bit about what you're doing? Sounds like a drum. And uh, and I think people would love it. They'll know how to actually use their drum heads then. Yeah. So, of course, from, from working for a drum head company and developing drum heads for them and, and really experimenting with creating certain sounds for drummers through the development of these products, um, I got incredibly fascinated with the world of tuning and i have to i definitely have to give a, a serious shout out to um, bob gatson um, for all of the information he passed along to me um, bob was involved with developing a lot of the early drum heads uh with bob beals um, this is before didarium company had purchased the evans drum head company in 1995 um, there were all sorts of new developments with you know the addition of 
um, these uh, overtone control rings around the outside. That was something like what we know from the Power Stroke series of drum heads. Yeah. That was something that Bob Gatson and Bob Beals developed with the Evans EQ series. And coming to where we're at now, uh, a good friend of mine and I, uh, this guy by the name of Cody Ron, uh, who's a blue collar drummer in New York City, he's a, a full time player and recording drummer here in New York. Just a couple weeks ago, we hit our, our one year anniversary. And uh, it was 52 episodes. Without fail, we've released a brand new episode every Tuesday for a year. And uh, we, we just kicked things off for season two and have absolutely no intention of stopping. Nice, so, man. Uh, that's, that's a huge, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a huge a time commitment. And I can speak from experience of it's, it's always after the first couple months, it's like, it never stops being fun, but it's like, I mean, you got to stick with it. The, the initial kind of like oh, yeah. uh, honeymoon phase, whereas often you go, holy crap, I got to get another episode out or another video. So no, I highly recommend people go to it. Um, if you go to soundslikeadrum.com, it'll redirect you automatically to uh, the YouTube page and you can find them on Instagram. You can find them everywhere. So it's just full of good information and you can actually um, kind of take what we talked about today and uh, look at drum heads a little bit differently, which um, I know I certainly look at Remo a little, little bit different. I, I still love them, but... Um, it kind of puts it all into perspective, the whole Remo and Evans thing. I know I should say I look at Evans different differently because I, I, I now kind of see him as more of a classic brand than I did before. Yeah, and I think it's also important to remember, too, that uh, at this point in time, you know, today, I don't know how many people at Remo actually know any of that story. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's been bought and sold. And... Have unfortunately, kind of, yeah, it may have been kind of, it could have fallen by the wayside when Remo himself passed away. Sure. And so I, I don't know how much of that information is still documented over there. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's really cool that we can then provide uh, that information to a new generation of drummers. And um, I think you're doing a great thing. So um, Ben, man, it's been awesome talking to you today. Um, I think we've got a ton of good information and I will, as soon as this comes out, start posting more photos and videos related to drum heads. So check out uh, my Instagram at drum history podcast to see some cool stuff. And I'll be sure to post uh, Remo playing the giant, uh, the world's largest bass drum um, from Disney oh, world, yeah. which that's, that's just such a classic picture. That's just like, oh, yeah, everyone absolutely. thinks of that. Yeah. So Cool. Well, Ben, thanks, brother, for uh, being on the show, and um, good luck for season two of Sounds Like a Drum. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, and uh, definitely keep up the great work you're doing with uh, drum history. I think that this is a fantastic thing to have, and everything that you're doing it is just a really great contribution to the community. Awesome, man. Well, I couldn't do it without people like you. So, cool. All right, Ben. Have a good one, man. I'll see you later. Thanks so much. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.